I'm going to talk about uh, world cities as engines for change using some of the experience from the C40 group. But just quickly, to, to, for those who don't know the C40, to say something about that first. It's an organisation which now has something of the wrong name. It's an organisation, in fact, of now 75 megacities. We've had a few new members in the time since we send the information over to the, to the conference, uh, representing collectively about 11% of the world's population and 25% of global GDP. So collectively, it's a, a very strong force uh, in the issue around climate change, which is what we focus on. And it brings together those megacities to work together to tackle climate change. But we do have this other category in addition to the megacities, which is a population of over 3 million in, in the, the city, we have a category of innovator cities, which is where uh, Oslo fits in. And these, these are cities that have been... This is a, a sort of exclusive club, which the existing members decide who should be any new members. And the innovator cities are those which the megacities have decided have shown such world leadership in one or two issues that they want them to be part of the club so that they can learn from them. Uh, and Oslo... Uh, was invited in partly on, on the back of the pledge for 100% renewable public transport, but also around its waste policies, its street lighting policies. And you can see it's in good company with Copenhagen, Portland, Seattle, and, and some others. We're, we're nearly 10 years old. It's an organisation that was started by my former boss, uh, Ken Livingstone, when he was Mayor of London, really as a product of, of us trying to develop a climate plan for London and realising we didn't have the skills and the experience in London, so we had to look out into the rest of the world, and that was such an enriching experience that we thought it would be a good idea to create a club of this other cities that were interested in it. It was then taken forward in a, in a partnership with Bill Clinton, uh, Mayor Miller, the former Mayor of Toronto, but then really transformed into a significant organisation when Mayor Bloomberg, the former Mayor of New York, took over in 2010 and created a professional staff but also membership standards, which I'm going to talk a little bit about for the organisation, uh, and a networking way of working. So not just sort of conferences, but some, some uh, dedicated networks within this big network. And we're now led by the Mayor of Rio, uh, who has very much brought the Global South into C40. So we will soon be an organisation which has the majority of the members are from the Global South, not from Europe and North America, which is where we started. And... To say what we, we do is probably put best by one of our mayors. This is Mayor Hidalgo, the mayor of, of Paris. Uh, and she says, as mayors, we all face similar challenges and have to innovate to solve them, often in the same ways. The C40 network connects us all, enabling us to share ideas, collaborate, working together towards a greener, healthier future. And at its essence, that's what C40 is about. It's creating the space where each individual mayor can be more ambitious because they learn from the experience, good and bad, from their peers. So why can we sort of claim that cities are the engines for change in, in the world today? And I have to say, in putting that, that title up, um, if my, my good friend Benjamin Barber, the uh, American political philosopher, were here, he would say that's too weak a title. What you should be talking about is why mayors should rule the world. And his, his thesis is, a, is, which I've tried to capture in two of his quotes here, but is, it, is in the first instance that essentially nation states have proved themselves incapable of solving the big global problems um, of today. He says, they're too inclined by their nature to rivalry and mutual exclusion. They seem quintessentially indisposed to cooperation and incapable of establishing global common goods. Essentially, when nation states get together to try and solve glo global problems, they're confronting each other with treaties, with armaments, um, with protective trade barriers, and it leads to a situation that, that is, a, is a race to the bottom. And ba Barber's argument is that instead, and again I'll quote him, cities are increasingly networked into webs of culture, commerce and communication that encircle the globe. These networks and the cooperative complexes they embody can be helped to do formally what they do now informally, governed through voluntary cooperation and shared consensus. So his thesis there is that cities, although they do compete, and we've heard a bit of that here today, the sort of uh, Copenhagen versus Oslo versus St Stockholm, they do compete, but the way that they compete with each other is a race to the top. It's to invest more in the city, have better public services, a better cultural offer to attract the best talent and invest, attract investment into the city. So it has a positive ramifications rather than the negative ones that are associated with competition between nation states. 
So Ben Barber's thesis is actually you shouldn't worry about the United Nations and the intergovernmental framework. You should hand it over to a new global parliament of mayors. I, that is not a view of C40 and not something I am, I am empowered to talk about. But what, where, we, where we do definitely agree is in the, this specific field of climate change, cities do, and city leaders do have a very significant role to play in solving the, tackling the problem of climate change, but in particular, closing the, the short-term emissions gap. And the graph on the, on the screen here is showing, with the blue line to the top, the business-as-usual line of, of where global emissions are heading. And, and as a, a sign of the failure of the intergovernmental process here, since the Kyoto Protocol came into being a little under 20 years ago, global emissions have risen by 60%, not fallen, as they were, in, they were supposed to do. The, the blue shading under that is the actions that have been committed by national governments so far. And if you look right to the bottom, that's where we need to be. So there's a huge gap between what the nation states are, are pledging. The, the orangey sort of yellow line is what's been pledged by C40 cities so far. So you can see it's, it's a significant but not big enough chunk. And really what C40 is about is helping cities to be more ambitious to extend that wedge that can close the emissions gap between where we are and where we need to be to have a climate-safe world, and in doing it through the megacities of the world to inspire uh, thousands of other cities around the world. But it's not just climate change that, it, that it's on the agenda for issues that these groupings of cities in the C40 and elsewhere can start to solve, even if our primary focus is climate change. And I'll just give one example here, because it's a, an issue that's been brought to us recently to try and help, which is... When you see those, those horrible pictures of, of the world's oceans that have these tens of miles, sometimes hundreds of miles of plastic waste that have all converged together uh, in the middle of the, of the oceans, over half of that waste comes from cities in just six Asian countries. And most of those cities, most of that waste is coming from C40 member um, cities. And it's a, a problem of a, a, a confluence of two things. Tremendous expansion in the population and in the economy in those cities, which is, has led to increase in, in living standards in the last decade or so, but the failure of waste management pra practice to keep pace with that growth, and thus a huge amount of illegal dumping of waste directly into the sea. So one of the things that C40 is now trying to do is work, target those specific cities and work with them to raise this, their standards of waste management practice to the best in the world. And in so doing, one can solve a huge part of the problem of the global issue uh, of marine debris and all of its ramifications. So if part, the, part of the reason we say engine, cities are engines for global change is first that they are able to address the issues that really matter for the world. Secondly, that cities have proved more adept at working together than nation states have done. The final one, I think, here is in the words of the, the chair of the C40, Eduardo Pires, the mayor of Rio, which is simply that cities are where the future happens first. It's the excitement, the agglomeration of cities, which mean that most of the best ideas that change the world for the better and for the worst happen, happen in, in our great world cities, and they need to become the beacons that demonstrate how human civilization can be maintained and enhanced. So having put that as the kind of thesis of, of what's sort of possible, which is a big thing really, the mayors, the leaders of, of big cities changing the world, being the force that means that we can solve this existential crisis of climate change, how can that come about? And it, there's obviously there's a huge range of answers and we heard a lot of wonderful things this morning. It's very hard for anybody to follow uh, Jeanette Sadiq Khan and, and Philip Philip Roder, who I would often sort of quote, quote from. But I'm just going to try and, and concentrate on what the learning from the C40 itself. And the way that we try to organise is very much been embedded by, by Mayor Bloomberg when he was the leader of the C40 a few years ago. And it, and it builds up like this, and I've tried to do it in numbers here. The, the first is that the C40 speaks with one voice, which does not mean that we have kind of a conference of the mayors and we have votes and we have treaties that are trying to get everyone to agree. That's the sort of failed model of, of global governance. Instead, what we do is everything is done by consensus, but it's of consensus of the who wants to work on a zero waste to landfill. 20 cities put their hands up. They form a little network within the C40 and they work together on that. We don't ask the other 55 that don't agree with that to get involved. They're just outside of the equation. And gradually then... That, that 20 cities grows and it becomes 30 and 40 as they can see the success. 
And so the second number, the 15 networks, is that we now have 15 of those sort of networks within the big networks of big issues that a, a large number of cities have agreed to come together uh, and support each other in being more ambitious. And sometimes it's, it's one or two cities that are really far out there in the issue of waste, for example, it might be in Oslo or it might be in San Francisco, and many others leading and many others following. In others, it might be everybody trying to learn together at the same time. The, the next thing, though, and this, this three times more likely, is that we have a big focus on giving, helping cities to get the tools to measure their emissions and plan for how they're going to reduce them, as we were discussing in the session uh, er, earlier today, because our data shows that the cities that have got a, a robust climate action plan deliver three times as much action on climate change as the ones that don't. Even though you get mayors come in and say, I'm not going to waste time writing a plan, I'm going to get on and do stuff, the ones that say that don't do as much, the ones that have a robust plan do more. And that data-driven emphasis runs through everything that the C40 does. We require... We don't require any membership fee to be part of C40, but we ask for a hell of a lot of data so that we can really see that the city is delivering on the pledges that it's made, but also that we can compare across the cities and spot opportunities, see where one city's delivering something very successfully and there are other cities that have got similar powers, similar topographical conditions or whatever it is that gives the chance for replication. And as a result of that, we're able to show that over 8,000 discrete climate actions have been delivered by the C40 member cities the last time we surveyed them, which was two years ago, and it's about to go up. The number above that 91% then is the other part of the equation of the conditions of being part of the C40 is you've got to be an active participant. You can't just sign up and say you're a member. You have to be part of networks. You have to contribute something. And at the moment, 91% of our cities have participated in at least one network this year. We have 500 very active city officials that are in constant communication with each other. And the only ones that aren't doing it are the ones that are in really difficult political situations like Cairo in Egypt. And the final one, which is what I'm now going to concentrate really with the, the examples from the cities, is that there is some proof that this works. So there are a number of areas, and the one here is cycle hire, where there's been a 500% increase in cycle hire schemes in C40 cities in just two years, where we can see that that sharing of knowledge spreads good ideas much more quickly than would ever be the case if cities were trying to develop them individually. So three examples here. Um, when we, and this is all taken from our last survey, which is now a couple of years old. We're just about to publish a new one, but... When we surveyed our cities in 2011, half of them were introducing LED street lighting. Two years later, 90% were doing so, from, from hearing from examples from cities that had done it successfully. 13 had bus rapid transit schemes, mostly then in Latin America, all in the global south. Two years later, 29, that's now gone up to 36, had bus rapid transit. And actually now the majority are in the, in the west, so it's a spread of ideas from the south to the west. And then finally, the, this very specific here, Berlin's energy performance contracting approach to building retrofit has now been adopted in public buildings by 20 of our cities. So the, the principle behind this is all that the, the best inspiration for one city leader is to hear from another city leader who's already solved the problem. And by leader, that could be the mayor, but it could be, a, it could be a, an official high, high or low. And we've got these 15 networks across these different initiative areas. And to give a few examples of, of how the, this works. And this is uh, in, the, in, in waste. The um, mayor of Rio, Ed Eduardo Pires, came to the C40 uh, mayoral summit uh, in Seoul uh, three or four years ago and was astounded to sit there and hear that the recycling target that he'd been told by his officials in Rio was very ambitious was tiny compared to many of the other mayors standing up on the stage who were reporting 25, 50, even 75% rates of recycling. So he came back to Rio, told his waste management authority, we need to get a new target, I want to be competitive with the rest of the C40. As C40 for resources, we were able to get a grant from one of the international funds to help them develop a plan. Uh, they then worked with two or three um, cities that had very uh, advanced programs, San Francisco, uh, Bogota, and New York in this uh, occasion, with the result that Rio's recycling rate today has gone from 3% to 25% in just four years and is continuing um, to escalate. So that was an example of just one city kind of 
wanting to, to compete with the others. A, a sort of slightly different thing is the bilateral knowledge sharing that we see a lot of. Ho Chi Minh is one of, when the World Bank publishes its list of most climate stressed or threatened cities in the world, Ho Chi Minh is always in, in the top 10. It has extreme flood risk that existed before global warming, but which is now uh, greatly exacerbated. They've got massive new development, most of which has been taken on, what, on floodplain, and they're destroying much of the mangrove swamps that have provided natural flood protection. So it's a real crisis situation. They approached uh, C40 for help on this, and we've been able to connect them with the city of Rotterdam, which is one of the real world leaders, hundreds of years of experience uh, of, of flood, flood management. And they're now working very tightly together to develop plans and deliver them in, in Ho Chi Minh. But this has been a real uh, benefit for the Dutch economy here because it's mainly Dutch firms that are now providing the uh, expertise that's delivering in Vietnam. A slightly different example, because these, are, these two, first two are about individual cities being helped by one or two others, is within our low-carbon vehicles um, network, where until Chinese, Chinese cities started to join um, a, a year or two ago, the ambition level for most of the cities was to get one or two pilot electric vehicles on the road in the next three or four years. I, I know from talking to, to the mayor yesterday, Oslo has an entirely uh, more ambitious programme, and I don't know if, if Draman likewise. But for most, most cities, that's where they were at. In contrast, when Shenzhen, Shenzhen joined this network, it said, but we've already got 1,300 electric buses on the road already. We're aiming to get 6,000 in the next two or three years. Why are you messing around with just two or three? Why, why is this a pilot? This is, these are mass-produced vehicles that are, are robust and already working. And you look across the rest of the Chinese cities, and it's a very similar story. Shanghai will have 1,700 by the end of this year. Beijing's just ordered 1,000. Nanjing, uh, 800. Dali, in a city most people have never heard, even heard of, will get up to 5,000 by the end, end of this year. So... That the inclusion of this new city has totally transformed this network, and as a result of it now, uh, we had 20 C40 cities recently publish a clean bus declaration, which was an essentially a message to bus manufacturers everywhere in the world, we don't want to buy petrol and diesel buses anymore, we can see that they're working in some parts of the world, start providing them to us at a cost that's affordable and at a scale that can, we can roll out right across the network, and that will enable us to go from the current plans, which would be uh, about nine, 900, under a million tons uh, per year avoided, to over two million um, within the next five years. And I hope actually it will become much more ambitious than that once we see the bus manufacturers uh, start to move. And there's a meeting with the bus manufacturers in London uh, in a few weeks' time. So I'd said before, and you heard from, from Jeanette Sadiq Khan, that our respective uh, patron, Mayor Bloomberg, is very much data-driven, can only manage what you can measure, and therefore, as you would expect, much of what we do in C40 is driven by the data that we get from cities. And when we look at the, the emissions values that come, come back, we see that building is an area that we very much have to concentrate on. I think Philip showed a similar graph earlier. Within the C40, 45% of reported emissions comes from building, much higher than that in, in Europe. It's slightly brought down by the, the Southeast Asian uh, figures. And there are a number of ways in which we're starting to the, address that in the West. It's particularly about building retrofit. But I think in the, in the context of, of future built, one of the most uh, exciting projects in C40 for me is the Climate Positive Program, which is an attempt to take 20 major developments across 15 of our cities around the world, uh, which are mostly big, mixed-use, residential and commercial space developments, where we have a combination of big real estate developers and a major city government client, and turn the best practice in those 20 developments into a global standard for low-carbon development. And indeed, the, the concept with climate-positive development is that these big developments can be not merely net zero within the, co the, the geographical boundary of the development, but are net exporters of renewable energy to the city around and therefore start to stimulate action across uh, the whole of the, the city. And they're aiming for a target where these developments will be 1.5 tonnes of carbon uh, per, uh, per person within the development. The example on the screen there is, is relatively close by. It's the, the Stockholm Royal Seaport, and Stockholm is the leader of this network. But perhaps to sort of finish with the, the examples, the, the sort of broader context in which all of this is, is working is the desire to 
achieve that sort of idea of, of falling carbon emissions but rising economic prosperity and, and greater uh, quality of life. This is, this is a, one of Philip's graphs that he showed earlier uh, and it's for the city of Portland showing how they've had very strong, the blue line, strong uh, GVA per capita growth, uh, G GDP if you like, uh, at the same time that, that carbon emissions have gone down very steeply, in their case largely through to a building energy uh, efficiency program. This is really where one, one gets the mayor's attention within the C40 when they see these kinds of graphs and they can see that there's an economic success story. And I think the New, uh, new Carbon New Climate Economy Commission, which has been very much supported by the government of Norway, is really making great strides here. It's a new report about to come out that really conclusively demonstrates it's not just that taking action to tackle climate change doesn't need to be that expensive, but, but our economies around the world will grow faster and reduce inequality faster and be much stronger if we take a low-carbon route rather than a high-carbon route. And in cities, we really see that. If you just take, first of all, the negative, negative side of things, in Beijing now, the cost of air pollution is 15% of GDP. It, even in a city like London, it's, it's 1% or 2%. Sao Paulo, 16%. Or to take the positive aspect uh, from, from my city in London, for every dollar here, to put it in, in the, the, the global uh, finance parlance, for every dollar that is spent on reducing fuel po poverty through improving building energy efficiency, there's a saving to the National Health Service of 42 cents. So very considerable and quick um, payback. Which means, uh, sorry, the, the fin final point here, of course, is that actually, perhaps slightly counterintuitively, the current economic conditions are rather conducive to putting forward this, this argument for green growth. Because on the one hand, you've got falling fossil fuel prices, which you might think means it's more difficult to, to make the case for investment in renewable energy. But of course, it also make, makes the case easier for removing the subsidies for fossil fuels. And really what drives the price differential between renewables and fossil fuels is the extraordinary subsidies that exist. Sec secondly, it's that the interest, interest rates are so low in most of the world, so this is the time you really can get big capital programs underway to start investing in our low-carbon future. But finally, the, the, the ground is shifting, particularly with China now really adopting sustainability as a serious part of its, its economic program. There's a chance to change the way that the global economy works. And the, the real big opportunity for this, of course, is COP21, uh, in Paris. And here, there's a big political shift taking place. COP21 in Paris, of course, is definitely an opportunity to massively ramp up action on climate change. Indeed, most of the negotiators would candidly say that it's the last chance for an intergovernmental treaty that really can prevent temperature rises going above the, the so-called safe threshold of two degrees. But if, this, if Paris fails, then I think it will be even more calamitous than the failure in Copenhagen, which depressed action around climate change for most of the last five years. And in Copenhagen, cities were sort of a positive force, but completely on the margins. There was a wonderful event that C40 participated in, organised by the mayor, but it was out on the fringe. The national governments weren't interested, the media wasn't interested, they were all focusing on what the nation states were doing. In Paris, cities are likely to be really central partly because we're now a big and organised force and we're going to be there in, in large numbers with a big voice, whatever the nation states do, but also because the, the lead actors within the inter intergovernmental process have really got the need to put the cities on the platform. So the French government has been leading this thing, the Lima-Paris Action Accord, which has four pillars to it, only one of which is the treaty itself, and the fourth one, which is really being stressed, is action by non-state actors, by cities, by states and regions, uh, and by business. There's also the Yale Climate Dialogue, one of the, the world's most well-known universities, is about to put out a publication that says that actually mayors should be formal signatories to the treaty, so that you can add in the action that mayors are taking alongside that of nation states. And indeed, the New Climate Economy um, Commission itself makes the point that the 500 largest cities in the world are expected to del deliver 60% of global GDP growth through to 2030, and with that, as business as usual, 50% of carbon emission growth. So they can't be ignored. And what we know from our own statistics is, at the moment, about 80% of the pledges that are being made by mayors are not included in their respective national government contributions. So there's a chance to really stimulate the ambition of what comes out of Paris. So what C40... Uh, along with Mayor Bloomberg in his role as the special envoy for 
for cities and climate change have been really pushing is what you might call city-determined contributions. The language of the United Nations is nations will not be making pledges, they'll be made, making nationally determined contributions that say what, how they're going to cut their emissions. And there's now a parallel cities process called the Compact of Mayors, where mayors have to make uh, a pledge to, first of all, measure their emissions on a common global standard to set a target for reduction and then put in place a robust public action plan for how that will be achieved. And we're attempting to get all of our mayors within C40 to achieve that by Paris and then be able to publish the aggregate of that to give some hope that on top of what the national commitments, which won't go nearly far enough to put us on a path to a climate-safe world, that the cities will help to close that emissions gap. So what we're hoping to achieve is to kind of shift from the top picture here into the lower. The top is the, I think, an accurate reflection of the Copenhagen climate talks. You look at that picture and they were never going to come to an agreement that was going to save the world. You look at the bottom picture, which is taken uh, from the last C40 steering committee. These are people who can work together. They're happy to hold each other's hands and smile and look each other in the face and work together on the basis of consensus. That's where I was going to end, but I, I added in a slide at lunchtime. As we, as we had a, the, uh, a rock star transport planner on the stage earlier in Jeanette Sadiq Khan, which I think was an accurate predict, uh, uh, presentation for anyone saw, who saw Jeanette today. I cannot uh, possibly attest to be anything in that league, so I thought instead I'd put a real rock star on the slide. This is, uh, this is Ian Brown, the lead singer of the, the greatest band in the world, in my opinion, my humble opinion, the Stone Roses. And he, he very clearly encapsulates the reason why I think there should be some optimism going into Paris. And it, he was here responding to journalists, constantly asking him questions about Manchester, which is the city where he's from, and wanting to pigeonhole his band as being part of Manchester. And his point was, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. You know, what, what people should be interested in is the new music he's creating and why he's doing it and what he's thinking. And one of the reasons one could have to be pessimistic looking to Paris is we're a long, long way away from where we need to be at the moment to put the world on a path to avoiding catastrophic climate change. And this really is an existential crisis. Even in the C40 cities, which are ahead of most of the nation states, on aggregate, they're still a long way away from where they need to be. But the reason to be positive is where, where they're at. The direction of travel is going in the right direction. Most of the mayors in the C40 now accept what Philip Road was saying this morning, that you need to plan for a compact, a dense, transit-oriented cities, and you need to be highly coordinated, working together with other mayors around the world to raise your level of ambition. And in the C40, we really see that ability and willingness of mayors to work together on the basis of consensus to try and tackle these big global problems. So I, I go into Paris with a sense of hope, and it's been very much exacerbated by being here today and the extraordinary positivity uh, and, and high level of thinking that I've seen here today. So it's been wonderful to have the opportunity to join you. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for giving us a very inspiring lecture after a long day. <laughs> so, well, I think you, uh, you're absolutely a rock star. You have managed to convince these mayors to go into this network, and that's a big thing. As a supplement, I'll say with Jeanette Khan, in Mark, we trust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I have a question for you, uh, because you have been the advisor for the mayor of London. And in September, there will be uh, the local election here, election for the local authorities here in Norway. And uh, how can we help our mayors to, um, and politicians to become brave and make uh, green urban development a hot topic in the election? Do you have any advice? Well, I'd say it was interesting. I met, met with the mayor of Oslo uh, yesterday. He was going through, and through an election himself. I was incredibly impressed by how on top of the detail of the climate change plan in Oslo he was and how much it seemed to be... In, he was going off to a, a TV debate, I think, afterwards, mm -hmm. yet he was still in the mindset. But I, to, I think that the, the, the simple answer is most politicians in the world, mayors or otherwise, don't want to be the first to do things because that's 
pretty tough and things go wrong when you're, when you're the first. <laughs> they want to have seen someone else do it and then copy, or at least they don't want to be the first on everything. So the best way to stimulate any one mayor to do something is show them that what you're t asking them to do that they think is very difficult and ambitious has been successfully delivered somewhere else and that mayor got re-elected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Pleasure. Thank you.